Okay. Okay. So we are here today with Tom Mann. He is uh, at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. He and his wife, Deborah, uh, do uh, salamander saving off of the Natchez Trace Road. When the salamanders are crossing, they go out with their volunteers and assistants and help the salamanders get across, try to uh, save as many as they can. They also, at the museum, have a place where they can help injured salamanders. So this is Tom and he has some slides for us and enjoy. Um, uh, I'm gonna mainly deal today with, with a, a couple of the capture histories of two of the salamanders we've encountered the last several years. Uh, Deb and I marked salamanders back in 2014 and 2015, Webster's with um, injectable VIE um, elastomer. But since then, either they, the animals have died of, of old age and or the turkeys have gotten them. So we have not marked them in recent years, but they come with natural markings. I'm going to go over those here. Two easy ones in this case. I have two females, one with missing a right eye and one missing a left eye. They don't grow those back. And we kept track of those for two or three years now. So I want to go over the detail, the, their capture histories and some of the details we usually recognize them again, even without... Um, uh, anthropogenic markings. So, uh, page, let's see, next slide. Um, uh oh, next slide is not, it's not working. So let's see. Down. Oh, all right. So, um, this is a, an overview, a quick overview of the setup at the trace. The trace is Natchez Trace in Clinton is running northeast, uh, southwest. And the outcrop from which these animals are moving is on the west side of the road. You can see it um, in this picture here, the limestone outcrop. And that outcrop is about 80 meters on one edge from the trace. The trace at this point is flanked by two 90 yard long silt fences, drift fences. And that's how we, that's what we use to intercept animals uh, on busy nights. We try, they can climb the fence on their own across the road, but that's not safe um, on busy traffic nights. And we try to be out there when traffic is highest and when it's in conditions the best are moving to intercept them. We, we have a few minutes to pick them up as they hit the fence. I photograph each one top and bottom, you'll see those today. And they would carry them across the road, release them, release them up the hill on the far side. Can y'all hear me still? Yes. Yeah, good. And we'll see them again then another three or four months heading back the other way. So that's going to be the routine. In the fall, uh -huh. we're, picking, we're picking them up at Drift Fence too. In the winter, late winter and spring, we pick them up at Drift Fence 3, heading back to the outcrop. So that's where we're going today. Um, page down, page down. Here's the, um, uh, the photograph of the fences. The, uh, the fence on the west side, that's, that's DF2, Drift Fence 2. The fence on the left side is Drift Fence 3. That's the side from which you can be coming well, next month. They'll be heading back to the outcrop. Next. Am I talking too fast? You're good. I'm talking too fast, slow me down. All right, first one, capture history of female missing her right eye. Um, we first got her on the 11th of November in 2019. In fact, we caught the other one that same night too. And these were outbound, outbound so they were on that western fence heading toward the east. Um, we missed her the following um, spring. We, she either came across and we weren't out there or we just didn't, didn't see her. Um, we picked her up again, outbound. 27th of November 2020, and then uh, March of last year. Um, another another overview thing here is when they're outbound, they're going to be real skinny, and when they're heading back to the outcrop, they can, they, they've been they've been abroad now, feeding in the leaf litter for several months. Probably found a mate, and they're ready to head back. Uh, so they'd be lean and fat, lean and fat, lean and fat, and that's the way it goes. Uh, uh, page down. Next. Okay. First one. Uh, 11, November, 11 November 2019. The original capture. Um, I have an arrow. Can you see the arrows okay? Yes. Okay. The arrows, these guys, again, guys and gals, these are both gals. Um, this one, if she was, she's missing her, her right eye. So there's no, you don't see any dark uh, eye. <laughs> Through, uh, right here, we have her upside down, but you would be able to see the dark place where her eye is. But it's, she has no eye there. And the arrow back here points to 
the um, the one one of her light erythivore patches. You can see the little sprinkling of light patches along the belly of these. These are all distinctive. They're all different, and they don't change over the lifetime. So we'll we're used to this. We'll grab onto one that looks particularly distinctive. A little constellation of these erythivores, and look for that each time we catch an animal. There might be a recapture. And, uh, we've actually contacted a. Um, I think I mentioned in my presentation there at the botanical gardens that we're in contact with the folks that do giraffe IDs. Uh, they they find the algorithms that can analyze the photos and, and they can do they can do um, ID or identifications based on uh, spot patterns. They do this with other species too. They can do these guys and we're in touch, but we have not. Uh, I need to label more slides for them. So uh, let's see if I can read this. Uh, so she has not eaten in six months. That's why she's skinny. Um, She's moved about 80 meters from the source outcrop of limestone and reached the road or reached the fence, and we picked her up, photographed her, took her across. Um, next, let's see. Page now. Page now. I need to hit. Now my page now is not working. Let me move this back. Try, uh -oh. I use, try using the arrow on your computer. Um, on your keyboard? That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, okay. When I move the meeting thing, it seems like I mess things up. Sorry. Um, or, um, so well. or, you may, or you may be able to click the mouse if you have a mouse. Yeah, I have the mouse there. Okay. Did you try clicking that? Yeah, I did that page there. All right. So all right, good. So here, here's a close up of the same animal. Now you can see this little, see this little white patch right there. It's got a little handlebar, not handle, it's got, it's like a little panhandle coming up this way. And again, the, trust me, these are this, these are, they differ among all the animals and the patterns don't change between captures. So I'm looking at that little, um, that little pattern right there and these two little parallel lines right there. Those enable me to, to identify this gal when I see her again. The trouble is um, you can't evaluate each animal uh, visually for this, but when you have, Animals missing an eye, it's a sense. You've already got a cue. Okay, we got a limited set of one line animals. Let's look at our pictures of those. So that's um, so salamander fingerprints. Let's see, page now. I gotta move this. Ah, okay, top side, same animal. See how skinny she is. I've got one arrow pointed to where her eye should be, no eye there. And the eye, the, the arrow across her tail indicates a zone where she's, had, she's regenerated that part of the tail. The color pattern is different uh, anterior to that um, uh, arrow and posteriorly it's, uh, and that, and that will not, the pattern in that, in the tail won't change either. Um, now we have um, gotten real good at, okay, here she is. Ah, first from capture, a year later, all right, so we missed her. We got her outbound in one year. Mister coming inbounding, and Mister went she was fat. Now we got her outbound again, close to the same part of the fence. It's midway down the fence. Very slender trunk still. It's, now you can see the same erythropore pattern, the little diagnostic shapes right there. And she's missing that um, that eye, uh, her right eye. So close up again. Now you, maybe you can see the patterns more clearly here. See the little the little blob with the little. Um, handle on it. Yeah. And two parallel lines there. Again, these are, you have to see a lot of these. Now, look at the tail. Webster salamanders can usually be distinguished from zigzags, and we've discussed this with your other colleagues there at the, um, the, the lakeshore. They have a light zone, a, a relatively pigment free zone right down the middle of the tail, usually. If they've got a regenerated <laughs> tail, though, they don't have that in the middle, so it becomes problematic, and they can lose the whole tail. So that's not a, it's a good feature, but it's not always there. But you can see it right here. I can, having looked at thousands of slides, I can see that this gal has a regenerated, she's got a break in the tail right there. She's grown a whole new tail out that way, but it now doesn't look, it doesn't have the clear zone in the middle. So, all right, next. Here she is again, top side, same day, 27 November, 2020. So this is the um, year before last. Missing that eye, they don't grow the eyes back, it looks like, and you can see the break in the tail again. The uh, little bit next. Ah, all right, so <laughs> now other details. This is me. 
Um, this is what my knee looked like last January when I fell during an evening walk on a steep road, blinded by headlights. That's my <laughs> kneecap. And anyways, I stay below. As I, is this is too gross for you folks. No, you're fine. That's, that's yeah, right. bad. As, yeah. I, as, I, as I rolled off the road, I thought to myself, I won't be able to recapture the two one-eyed salamanders being intercepted moving from west to east. I, I thought that as I rolled off the road. But I was wrong, thanks to Deb, the salamanders, and the trauma surgeon. Okay, next. That's the trauma surgeon's part. Ten days later, the fix is in. Four screws and a piece of wire. Are people smiling at this? <laughs> yeah, we are. All right. Um, anyway, so I sat in the car and watched. Deb. We didn't work the usual hours last year because Deb can only work uh, work so long. Uh, I'm, I'll stay up for hours and hours. But I was sat in the car and I took the brace off and worked my knee. Uh, try to limber it up. And she would occasionally bring animals back to me for a quick photo. And I'm still thinking in the back of my head about the two one eye ones. Well, so here I'm sitting in the car with the brace off, and she brings a scoop up. With two animals in it, and I and I, I took a quick picture, sent her back to release the animals, and I said, "Whoa, Nate, that, bring them back. That's the one I. It's one of the one-eyed females." I was so excited. I get out of the car, forgetting I had the brace off, got my crutches out of the back, got my better photography gear, wandered down that wet right away, set myself up, took good pictures, not these, took good pictures, and I was just pumped. I was pumped, and Deb was furious because I was missing. I did not have the brace on. She felt guilty. <laughs> so she's very embarrassed by this. I'm pumped. First time I walked without a brace in three months, uh, or two months, two months, and I was just, and we had the recapture. How great. Anyway, so back to the salamander. Missing an eye, and you can see where her tail had been regenerated right there, and she's accompanied by a male uh, missing his uh, right rear foot. So next, tough world, tough world. All right, so again, this is March of last year. Of last year, this time we got her on the way back. She's been feeding on winter. Look at the difference. Fat. She's got eggs uh, full of eggs. I've got one arrow indicating those. They go and again. I show the diagnostic little iridophore patches and the and the area where the zone is of the tail has been regenerated. So this is this is the pattern. This is and she well illustrates that. Close up. You can see the eggs. Um, you can't quite count them, but in some you can. Uh, uh, stuffing your flanks there, the diagnostic iridophore patches, the break in the tail. It sounds repetitious, but it's uh, patterns in nature. Again, top side, missing eye, break in the tail. Uh, capture history. Now, this is, I was animal one, animal two. Capture history of female missing her left eye. Again, we caught her the first time on the same date we caught the other one, 11 November 2019. She was outbound. Then we caught her again later, inbound that spring, inbound fad, you'll see that. Then caught her outbound again the next year. Then missed her last year on the way in. We missed her. Um, again, we weren't running the fences as many hours as we usually do because I was injured. But we got her again this, this year, heading out again, skimming. So we'll go run through those quickly. Am I talking too fast? You're good. You're okay. good. Okay. All right. So we caught her. This is uh, the first capture. She's outbound. Actually, she's not, she's fatter than some of them are outbound. Um, it's fall of the year, November, uh, 11 November. And this is she's the lower animal here. The male is in the upper side. And just for points of reference, the male has a mental gland there and it's got a yellowish wall to his cloacal region. Female does not have that. Uh, you can see the orbit's missing right there on her, and she's got some other, she's got a crescent of iridophores right there, and that's the same every time you catch her. That catches our eye, we're, we're pretty good at this by now. Um, why, why are they different colors? Why are what different colors? The male and the female, they seem to have... Well, yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, the females often have kind of a, and it may not just be the females, but this one has kind of a, looks like a yellowish wash to her river fours, and this male happens not to be, um, but we have not, we have not, but that's it's a good observation. Uh, I don't think I would generalize across the sexes from this one slide, okay. but it may okay. be. All right, close up of the female again. See the crescent of river fours right there. In fact, she's got two little crescents there that catch your eye. There's something diagnostic here too. And her tail is regenerated, regenerated right here. 
we get a lot of stumpy, stumpy, almost completely tailless animals out there. I think it's turkeys, but there's other things too. We have a lot of turkeys out. As you can see how the, the, um, the zone beneath it, she does not have the light zone under the tail. It's kind of dense with pigment. So it'd be hard to identify as a web is that way. Okay, but there are other ways. Uh, next, page down, good. Close up on the heads. Uh, you can see again where her eye is missing there. There's the male's mental gland. Oh, this one's got this gal. Okay, it's her left eye. Uh, she's also got an injured left uh, front front foot here. The, the, you can't see the toes kind of curl up. That never changes. She's had that every time we catch her. So she's not what it, that has not been regenerated or can't be regenerated. It may have been injured at the same time she injured her eye. We don't know. Okay, next uh, top side, same. Again, first encounter with her, you can see she's missing the eye. I have one arrow to her injured foot. I have an arrow to the um, the break in her tail. It's been this regrown. But look at the color differences before and after that. Uh, is she yellowish there or orange just there? That will change in a couple of years. But for right now, it's, a, it's an indicator of a tail loss. Uh, it's just neat. Now, here she is on the way back. But she's climbed the fence without injured limb. She's missing an eye. Look how fat she is, just fat with eggs. She's fat. This is great. This is just, I mean, this they, in three months, they just turn, they just, they, she has fat reserves in her tail for, for living underground. Now for the next um, six months, this is, uh, there she is looking toward me with a good eye, kind of. Uh, again, she's heading back to the outcrop, and when she gets to the outcrop, she'll be underground for about six months. She'll lay eggs, she'll guard those nets, guard the eggs until they hatch. No one's ever seen this. That's assumed based on what the other animals in the genus do, but no one's ever seen a Webster's nest. So, so, so. here she is, the uh, underside, uh, the, the same date, 24 February, year before last. Uh, first recapture, the same pair of animals. I think I rearranged them here, but look at the eggs. Actually, now I take it back. This is not, this is not the same male and female. This is the same female, a different male this time. And they aren't necessarily together, other than Deb or one of us pulled them off the fence nearby, and I photographed them together. These, this is not a mated pair, as far as we know. Um, you can see all the eggs in this one. You can see the break in the tail. You can see the little crescent of aridophores. Okay, good. So, uh, again, the break in the tail, and they can see the aridophore crescent right there. This really stands out. Once you've seen as many thousands as we have, it can, all this stuff just lifts up. And you know what to look for when you're trying to distinguish individuals. Breaking the tail, color difference, missing eye, same deal. Again, she's pulling well over, heading back. This is February of 2020. She's on, so the year before last, she's on the way back to the fence or to the outcrop. And we're there to intercept her, okay? Here she is again in the fall of the following year. This is the, this is the fall of last year, fall of last year. Um, this is her last capture. So 2020, all right. Notice that she just came out of the rock. She's hit him out November, uh, uh, skinny as she can be. Same animal, you can see the little aridophore pet, the little aridophore crescents there. No mental gland, no yellowish in the um, uh, cloaca. She's a, this is a female. There she is again. Uh, see the um, well, I had the wrong date on that. This is 2020. Well, I had the wrong year on the previous slides. I'll fix that. Um, missing eye, injured foot. Uh, you can still see she's got two different two different colors dorsally on the tail. This will change with the next her next capture. Okay, underside. Uh, this is okay. This is last fall. Her third recapture. Left eye. Third recapture. Um, the usual uh, Ritifor crescent. Now I'm going to turn her over. And now the color is about the same on top. This is a bad angle, but the color is not, it's, it's about the same. So that's changed, but she's got dark cells, mel melanophore patches, dark organelles, uh, yeah, dark cells, uh, melanophore patches along her tail. And these 
They're in the same place they've been every year. I look. I went back to all the slides. So those are diagnostic, although now the color is no longer uh, different for and after that regenerated zone. So she's um, parts of her parts of her history have been obliterated by that color change, but other parts, the injured foot, the eye, are all still there. And she's doing what she always does, and about the same. Actually, she's moved down the fence a little bit. She almost missed the fence. She's at DF2 1.5, means she's at the southernmost panel of that fence. If she'd gone a little bit farther around, we would have missed her. Um, she would have crossed the road, maybe gotten run over without our uh, attention. Uh, next, again, the eye, the injured foot. You can see that better here. Same animal. Oh, all right. So that was our Webster stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I threw in some uh, odds and ends here. How are we doing time-wise? We're doing all right. I threw in some odds and ends, and I could have done more. This is for the. Um, I don't know that you guys and gals survey. Uh, uh, what's it? Uh, can't think of the name of your road now. Uh, Lakeshore. Oh, South Lakeshore. Do you sort? Do you survey Lakeshore when the little guys are out? We have not seen the little guys out, yeah. So no, so no one has ever seen this. No, we have not. Okay. This is a I found, this, I found a few. Okay, this is years. this is one Sunday morning, uh, two uh, two years ago, two years ago, uh, in May. It was rainy. It was daytime mainly, and I picked up about four hundred like this, one handful at a time. Wow! wow. This, so this is one I can't fill. This obvious I can't fill the scoop with. I'm picking up as fast as I can. <laughs> to keep them getting run over to minimize that. But if you if you have this many in the scoop, when you put it over to get another one, they're going to start crawling out. So at some point, I've got to just dump them. But I, and I want to dump them near to where I got them. So I have those two things to, um, to consider. This is about 35. Uh, brand new little spots. You can see you can, it, when I first started doing this, it was I thought it was difficult to distinguish little spot nets and little um, uh, marble nets, but it's, it's really not. Um, the little gold, they don't, these don't have the spots yet, but they have, they usually be a little a little gold along the tail, but what is always there, the spine of the tail extending onto the back, there's gonna be a little black line. You don't see an opaque them. So that helps Matt with these before they get their color patterns. And these are highly rare, but these are all spots. Um, again, this was in the daytime during the rain. Uh, wow. I get these every year. So that's, uh, and they climb, oh, can y'all see that okay? Yeah, yeah. So and so you were saying that you took that, you found those 35 during the daytime. They were four, crossing four in the hundred, 400. That was 400. And they were out in the daytime. It was, it was between it was between 6:30 and 10:30 or so in the morning. Maybe night. The Deb didn't I told Deb I had gone out to the trace to see if we got any. I expected to get some intercept some, but I thought they would stop it at um, dawn. They did not. I got to 6.30, they were there, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. And after three hours, she came out to see if I was okay. Uh, because she had, <laughs> she, and there I was, still daytime, in the rain, picking them up. Uh, those were metamorphs. This is a, a yearling. This one's been out for about a year since whatever left the pond. And this one reached our fences, and it's going over like the Websters do. They don't usually climb like this, but some do. Um, and they're pretty, and it looks pretty competent. But, uh, and they're beautiful little animals. Okay, next. Oh, I moved this around. See, when I move this, it changes stuff. Okay, so let's do this. Do it again. I'm not having trouble again. Shucks. Let's try it right there. Okay. Oh, bingo. All right. This is not a good picture. Sorry. Uh, but if you look at the look at the lower. Look at the left rear leg. Look at the toes. Can you see those? Yeah. Can you see how the four? This one toe has three three tips. Y'all ever seen that? I've never seen that. We yeah, can usually look at them closely. That may have to do with um, uh, a protozoan in the water, mm -hmm. which they emerge as um, yeah, you know, after they go through the larval phase. I've read that somewhere, but we see a lot of that. So, and that will help us with IDs later on. I just, and I have another slide of another one that's um, like that. All right, look at the right front foot on this one. 
to the fork there. Oh, I see that. Yeah. Also, the, and the oddities on the left front foot, they get by okay. This guy looks pretty healthy otherwise. But anyway, we, I'm just throwing this in as a, um, a slide of interest to you uh, spotted salamander folks. And we see similar stuff. Now here's something else. See the um, the yellow spots, the non the non um, chromatophore yellow spots. We got arrows to each one. These are parasites. See the little they're little they're little knobs here, and they're probably kind of, they're probably trematode larvae. And this has to do, we think, with um, if that's what they are. With um, it's usually a uh, great blue heron um, snail fish life cycle. So the the, mm. the heron has the parasites, defecates the um, eggs of the um, uh, trematode germinate in the water, and they infect the snail. And then they leave the snail and affect something else, usually fish, or maybe the snails eat my fish. But in this case, they get into these guys. Um, and I think it may be a dead end host. I don't know that this is going to, going to um, uh, well, it may not, I don't, I'm not sure about that. It may be if they eat a mature salamander, they still got these guys that need the life cycle continues. But these we picked up at the fence. They moved hundreds of yards from the, um, from the source pond, and there's, they look okay, other than the knobs on them. But that's something else you can watch for. All right, this is not a good shot. I've got, I just stuck this in this morning. These are all marble salamanders. These are little marble salamanders. Not a good picture, uh, but we, we see the same phenomenon, but I don't get these in the daytime or very little. Um, and mainly I'm getting the spots at night too, the little guys. But then I dumped that scoop out. Here they are. Again, these are all marble salamanders. Um, and, but it's the same, I can get hundreds of these um, on a good night and a good year. And last one, uh, I will toss this in. I, uh, I talked about this yesterday with Michelle. This is what I want you guys to find. This is a young of year, a fair, pretty fair fresh hatchling, um, hatch this year anyway, um, Webster salamander, found near the odd crop, which we've been studying now for 10 years. And, but you're going to have these on your hill too. You will have animals just like this somewhere, probably somewhere on your hill, somewhere near some magic. For those that read Harry Potter, these are going to be. This is the flu network. This is the um, the magic spot where you go in, <laughs> where you go underground and disappear for the summer, or come up again um, in the winter. <clears throat> There'll be something like this. So I want y'all to find these guys. So, so what what time of year do we need to be looking for this? You're going to find yearlings right now. I can, find okay. them, I can find them two months ago. I, um, they don't usually come up quite as early as the adults. I usually start getting them in November, maybe late November. This was this was December of uh, 2010. This is year I first found the little guys out there and first realized that, oh, this is why the animals are crossing the road and the, the egg bound, the egg, the egg packed animals are crossing the road toward the outcrop in March. They're heading back here to breed. That's when we 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 um, firmed up a hypothesis about migration and tested it here with the fences and with observations and, and confirmed to our satisfaction that it's indeed what they're doing and that they do this at every outcrop. They're doing it in Alabama too. Uh, if you have more outcrops closer together, the pattern will be harder to discern than it is where we are. We have one isolated outcrop, but you guys will get this too. Animals are gonna retreat to these areas to spend the summer. Females go down to um, lay eggs, guard those, come up again in the fall, hungry and split. And a little bit later, the kids come out and they won't go as far. Or they're going to go maybe 30 meters from the rocks. They won't go too far. Then they go back to the same place they came out of, back underground. They stay up longer. We get these into May here because uh, they have to, again, they've got to build storage reserves to get through the, the months without feeding. So, so there's that. That may be it. Oh, that was it. It's an awfully cute one. Okay, that'll work. That will work. We get these at the, on our Webster's fences, and sometimes it's the dominant animal in the fall. Maybe uh, not when the, the, we get lots of these. Huh. That's a really nice one. The yeah, guy, that's good. Uh, the guy, good. The, the editor of the most recent um, uh, Peterson Field Guide to Herps is uh, Dr. Powell. He said he was glad his research animals didn't climb. And I said, what was your research animal? He said, spotted salamanders. I sent him this picture. His research uh, do climb. Now, we don't yeah. see spots like this, but we do get little spots. And we get a little papers doing this, too. So. Yeah, that's, that's interesting.
All right, so is it is it okay if we ask you questions now? Sure. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna go through my list. Um, when do uh, spotted salamander mets migrate out of their ponds? Okay, it, dep it depends when the pond was filled in part. They have a couple of months they're gonna have to undergo a successful larvae to even, to even uh, have the possibility of shedding gills and, and assuming the terrestrial phase. But so if, you're, if, you're, if your ponds are filled in January, animals are moving then, then a, a couple of months after that, the animals are ready, the larvae will be ready to, um, to, to assume the next phase of the existence. That's gonna vary depending on rainfall. If you have a late winter filling of ponds, it will be farther delayed. Again, that's down here. Up north, it's completely different. But we, we're usually one of the first spots in the country to report um, spotted salamander migrations. Uh, we don't have to wait for the um, snow to melt or the ice to thaw. Uh, so uh, the answer to the question, depends on when the eggs were laid, how warm, how cold the winter was, and how long the water remains. Uh, but I usually get them in April and May and June, but I get them later too in some years. I get them later and there, there's something, there's a pond we call the stock pond that never dries. It's on the northern end of this reach. So it doesn't, it's, it doesn't, uh, animals are not forced to leave because the pond is dry. So they linger there longer. We get larger marble salamanders coming out of that, although they're not supposed to linger like that, but they do. We get bigger marble salamanders and we get a little bit bigger spots coming out of that pool when they do finally leave. And it may be in August or September, but if your mm -hmm. ponds are drying, they're gonna leave sooner. And our big month is usually May and June for okay. a month earlier for marbles, but they overlap, okay. they overlap. All right, we'll know when to try to look. Uh, so do yearling spots, do they, uh, do they migrate to the ponds then the next year like the adults do, or do they stay underground? Okay, they're not, well, they would have no reason to go to ponds because it's going to take them years to grow up. I don't, I don't know how old they are when they're mature here and head back. And that's when they would head back. And interestingly, they cross the roads in a different pattern than the adults. The adults will cross... Um, Oh, open areas, not close to trees. I think the, the, the adults are making a dead reckoning back from where they have chosen to live out their terrestrial existence to where, where they were hatched. Or, um, but the kids leave the pond and, and try to stay under more tree cover. Uh, and they will they walk, they'll walk along a tree line until there's uh, where the trees on opposite sides of the trace are closest so they have the least distance to go. Um, in the open and they'll often cross there. But on that rainy morning, <laughs> two years ago, I was getting them in the, in the more open areas as well. So generalizations are uh, uh, always have a caveat, um, but they're not coming in. We, always, we never see these guys ever. We never see these guys on the fence on the west side of the trace. We get them on the west side, I'm, that's a, I'm sorry, east side of the trace. We get them on the west side of the fence on the west side of the trays. They're, they're dispersing still, it may take them a year, but they're dispersing. We never see them, we never see little guys coming back the other way ever. So this is, this is. I don't know how long they disperse, I don't know how long, what, what, what determines how far they decide to go or not go, but they don't come, they, um, they're not returning, they're not recrossing the road as, as juveniles. Opacums may, but they're not going back to the um, pond either until they're mature and ready to go. Did I say enough on that one? Yeah, uh, that's good. Um, let's see. So how long do you think it takes for them to be old enough to uh, breed? I, do not, I, I, think I, I just right. guessed here. I, um, I'm going to guess four or five years for these, but I do not. It may be longer. I don't know. Okay. And at some point, we're gonna. I've got photographs of these guys. We'll sit down with the um, the giraffe folks, ID folks, and we'll go through all these slides and see if we can't come up with matches, of patterns like that with an adult that we might get a couple of years later and begin mm -hmm. to answer your question. But right now, I can't. We well, I can't. don't know. Like yeah. In, uh, Webster's, the Webster's you saw earlier today, the ones we um, the two we focused on, were adults when first captured. Each had already had long histories, though. Each had regenerated a tail. And whether they were first year adults or second year adults or older, I don't know. But we know, we know that each would be a minimum of four or five years old. They could be older, we just don't know. Mm. 
they were both adults. Yeah. Um, so here's a question about Webster's. Uh, why are Webster's heading to ponds during rains if they can't live in water, if they're terrestrial animals? That question was born of not being a biologist. <laughs> no, they had, in fact, we've had a, I've had a, um, an ophthalmologist volunteer um, at the Trace for He's been just been great for years now. And after two years of doing this, he asked me that same question. I said, I looked at him. I said, "What? These are entirely terrestrial. They never go to a pond. Now, if a pond, if a pond occurs or a little ephemeral basin occurs, where they are, they're going to leave. They don't like water." They want to be moist, but they don't like water, um, so they never go to water. Uh, so they're, they're just they're just traveling during the rains, then just to stay moist. Then they don't need the rain. All they want yeah. is wet leaves. They will move in and they'll move in rain, but all they need is a wet leaf. So that leaves me with a lack of sleep for many nights every um, every winter at the trace because I'm working wet nights and I'm working dry nights with a wet leaf. So, so, so Dr. Mann. What, uh, what, is, <laughs> what, uh, what what is it they're looking for when they when they make their breeding run? What habitat are okay. they going from and to? Uh, are we talking? All right, they what, make, the Websters. Oh, the Websters are not making a breeding run. Websters. This is the this is the this is why the experts that thought that they would not be migratory. Why would they migrate? They don't have to go to water to breed. Um, turns out that since all age classes, that's in the little guys you saw at the last slide, the juvenile, the second year juveniles, the adults, all of them disperse from where they come out of the ground. It can't all be about breeding. With the first years and second years, they're not even they're not even breeding capable. So they're we we assume they are spreading out from where they concentrate underground, simply to avail themselves of more of more. Food stuffs, the leaf litter, leaf litter uh, organisms. So they might be termites, might be ants, spiders, whatever. But they ra they're radiating out from these sources of concentration, but could just avail themselves of, of more feeding opportunities. And the females and males may get together and mate. But we get them, we get them, we get females with sperm plugs in them on the west side of the fence. Of the of the outbound fence because some of them are some of them are, are breeding on the way out and they're still moving um, so it's not strictly about that but but the the possibility of mating at the at the boundaries of wherever they're moving to with animals from other source outcrops keeps things um, uh, richer genetically as well so that's a good thing so there is there's surely some depending on where at your side in particular you're going to have multiple outcrops which are suitable for over summer animals radiating out from that may intersect animals moving from another one and they may interbreed and just keep keep their a richer gene pool going so but it's mainly one, about one, resources one more one more follow-up it what is the attraction of the limestone outcrop if there's not food there oh there is food but it, it it's, it's got the food is in the leaf litter so there's going to be food in the leaf litter, but if you've got if you've got a thousand animals crowded on a small hilltop, it may it just it's it makes sense to move out from that just to get more stuff, and that's what they're. Why, why are they crowded there? In because, the first place, uh, the, the limited the you're in Alabama in Mississippi, rocks are a limiting resource. Uh, they're less limiting on Shades Mountain. They are definitely limiting in most places, Mississippi. Um, so just narrow zones where the where the rock is exposed. And the rock and the rock that side may be suitable for moving in interstices, uh, crevices, what have you, and they can hide out in the summer there. So this is all the way down from uh, Mississippi to Louisiana. I went um, I went out uh, looking for what I was doing tail tip genetic surveys across the range, and as part of that, I met with uh, Jeff Bounty in Louisiana four or five years ago. It was in April. He said it's really too late to look for them. I said, "Just take me to the take me to a rock art crop, and I'll find them." He said, "There are no rocks." I said, "Okay." Anyway, I, I met with him, and we walked up the creek, the little the stream terrace. We had often seen them, and it had, wasn't long before on my right, the, the, you know, the, this is the Lessel Hills in Louisiana. We have them here in this very steep. I looked up at the hill, and there was an outcrop. I said, "There's your honey hole." Right away, we had four yearlings. This was in April, but we can actually do the same thing in May here. Again, they stay up longer, but um, they're gonna get, they have to get fatter. But the adults are all gone by then. He was right on that. The adults are underground by, by mid-April. They're gone.
and they won't be up topside again until Halloween that year, later. So again, they're dispersing just, we are, this is the assumption to avail themselves of more food stuff. So they're spreading out so they're not all, you know, chasing the same stuff in the same place. That's our best guess. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so um, this getting back to the spotted salamanders. That well, let, me, let, me, let me back up real quick. And this, okay. that, same, that same answer would hold for why we get this guy on this post, 200 meters from the um, outcrop. Again, they're spreading out for the same reason. Not for mates, they're spreading out so they have, they can avail themselves of more personal resources. The farther they get from this, the farther they get from the, um, they don't all just stop at the edge of the basin. And that would be safer if they all could do that, but then you'd have all these animals competing for the same feeding resources in a limited zone. By spreading out, you've got more stuff to eat. The risk is, you get killed doing this. Um, you get picked off by an owl. You get run over by a car. But, but this obviously, I mean, this is this explains why so many move so far. And these can go a long way. They go farther than Webster's. They're amazing. But it's the oh, same. Uh, how far do they go? Do you think? I've seen I've seen uh, marbles at least 400 meters from the nearest pond. But I, I think these guys do the same thing. They're going farther. They're going a long way. The little guys are, and when we get them at the trace, we get these guys at the trace, they've already gone at least 200 meters from that pond and they're still going. Now some probably stopped and some will be adults um, uh, between the road and the pond and they they have a safer existence. What what drives so many to move so far, I do not know. They may be monitoring scent trails and they may just keep going till the scent trails of each other kind of attenuate and, um, and it seems like there's not too much of, too big a crowd here. We put our roots right here. This is where we'll live. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Lots of mysteries here. Lots That's of neat. And then some of this may have been worked on by the people, but not the Webster's. This is, uh, but with spots, probably someone's looked at that. Mm. Uh, but I can't answer it. Um, so the spotted salamanders, they, they lay their egg masses in a pool. And well, the, they lay the eggs in the pool and it, you know, blows up into an egg mass. And it's always around a stick. If it falls off that stick, is it still going to be um, viable? I think they probably are. I think they're probably on the stick in part. It may depend on the, the water depth. Um, I think they may be there to make, to ensure that they're high enough in the water column to, to be better oxygenated. If you're on the, but I think you see them on the bottom as well sometimes. But if, if you get a lot of rain on the bottom, there may well be less um, oxygen available for development. I don't, that's just a guess. But I think that's probably why they put them on the sticks. The flip side of that is if you're up on a stick higher in the water column, there's likely to be damage from ice if you get a, um, a freeze. So, but they, mm -hmm. as you say, they're usually on sticks and usually not. If they're on the bottom, it's the bottom of a shallow pond. They don't put them on the bottom of the deep pond. Mm -hmm to my knowledge. And they can be put, I see them in tire ruts. So, I mean, a flooded logging, logging truck tire rut. Um, so they can be opportunistic as well. Hmm. I have a contact in um, uh, Louisville who has a little backyard plant, uh, you know, it's a plastic line uh, plant garden outside. She's got spots. They found her place. She's got a snapping turtle. This is a small little basin. They, the spots and the snapping turtle found her place and they're using it. That's amazing. So these are not animals that grew up there. They're, they're, you know, there's opportunism here everywhere. They're generally the return to where they were hatched or born, but not always. There's always a, a, something in there for colonizing new spots. So, Yeah. Um, so when the adult Salamanders, spotted salamanders, finish breeding and laying eggs. Do they return to their forest home in a mass migration, or is it spread out? I think it's uh, here. I think it's typically more spread out. Again, the males usually arrive first, or more males arrive first, and that may be because they're not quite as girthy midships as the females are. They just travel easier. That may be why. But they're usually first, not always, but usually. And they're waiting and waiting and waiting, putting out spermatophore patches. Do you guys ever see spermatophore patches? 
Y'all see that? Sometimes I have seen them before, but not always. I always check when I'm certain. When I'm certain, go ahead. I interrupt. Like little white mushrooms all over the bottom, scattered over the bottom. Yeah, they'll be like there'll be a patch. You know, right. so, yeah. two, three feet across. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I often do those when I'm out looking for eggs. This time, I mean, I look for those as well. I found a bunch last week, last weekend, but no eggs. So that was interesting. So the males have been out there, and whether they'll put those out without females present, I don't know. That would seem silly, but uh, there were no eggs, just for metaphors. Um, anyway, so this, the, the return is staggered. The males, I don't know how how long they can uh, produce metaphor patches, but at some point, I'm sure they're exhausted. It's time to head home. The females, well, the fe but they're, but they're going to stay as long as they can to maximize many opportunities. The females, as soon as they lay, I'm supposing they take off. They again, they're that's they're getting one chance to lay eggs, and when they finish, they're going to go unless there's a resting involved as well. But they tend they they'll um so it's uh, I can imagine rainfall events and such that that would lead to more. Uh, synchronicity in exits, but we typically don't get the mass. Um, we never see as many at one time outbound as inbound. That is us. So, so do you, do you think the spermatophores stay viable? If I, I don't, I'm sure that's answered. Someone knows it. I don't. I don't know how okay. that. The whole idea is that the the males um actually guide the females over the spermatophores over the air spermatophore. Mm -hmm. Pick this one, not this one. So there's mm -hmm. a and again, so I, I don't, um, whether the males would even lay a patch of metaphors down without even seeing a female, I don't know. Um, that's, I'm sure the literature is, has something to say on that. Um, uh, Cause I think, yeah, uh, uh, they, you don't want to waste your efforts either. <laughs> uh, it's, a long, it's a long crawl. It's a long crawl. Yeah. So, so while they're waiting in the pool for a rain or to or to rest or whatever, they just hunker down under leaves and mud in the. Pond. I think so. I think so. And I get them. You get them beneath the limbs at the pond margin, but I get them. I get them under semi-immersed logs as well, um, and in logs as well, but close to the water. Um, I don't know what they do when ice storms come in, but then they may retreat to deeper areas. This is this is more. You've seen the tails. These are these have nice swimming tails. It's a. It's a species you can handle that aquatic environment better than something like a, a marble salamander with a round tail. Marbles don't want to be in the water either. They want to, but these guys don't mind. So the guys and gals. So do you think it takes a, a heavy rain or a light rain or does it matter uh, for them to start their migration? Oh, shoot. Um, again, it probably depends on the year and how late in the season the rains come. Um, but they, they definitely these guys move and gals, gals move better in a harder rain. But everyone that's done this has seen them moving on wet roads without rain too a little bit. And I've seen them uh, last week. I didn't get them at 44 degrees. It looked like conditions are good. The rain was not heavy, but it was wet enough. Everything was wet. They could have moved them, but at 44 degrees, they weren't. But I've seen them in the upper 30s moving too. And again, it may depend on how late in the season it is and how desperate they are. Um, so that's, uh, need to talk to a spotted salamander person about that. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so if, if they, if like a salamander was moving late, kind of late in the season to the pond, uh, and then uh, they, they never really finished the, the breeding, uh, do they, Will they just return back to the forest? If well, that's a good point. So would a, fe would a female late in the season, um, would she just go down to the pond and, and lay eggs regardless? Or would she, is there some point where she would give up and, and reabsorb eggs and go back home? I do not know that for either sex. I don't know whether they ever give up. You know, whether once they launch that journey, they're gonna go down to the pond and, and find what they find. I don't know that. Um, can she reserve? We've asked the same question about Webster's that we catch on the, uh, we catch heading back to that crop. You see, you saw the females the pictures with the eggs we'll get females like that full of eggs and no tail so they have no resources to tap to live through the summer so are those gals are going to go if they make it back to that crop they're going to go back and go under and lay eggs and guard them until they die or are they going to maybe reabsorb the eggs grow a new tail to live through the summer and try again the next year you know where what 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 do you do i don't know how they answer that question 
or if they even can answer that question. But we get um, some of our best records are stump-tailed females that are easier to identify that have made um, made the crossing from the road to the outcrop in, in, in like 12 hours. But what you know, what do they do? They can really regrow tails nicely, but what do they do? Are they going to lay eggs and starve to death? Well, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Brown answer ask you some questions. I think I got through most of mine. So I'm gonna let him ask you some questions now. And go ahead, Jim. Would these be stumpers? No, no. Uh, years ago, Tom, uh, I knew an amateur herpetologist up in Tennessee who was interested in the marble salamanders around some ponds in a state park near Lebanon. And he claimed, uh, you just tell me if you think this is plausible. He claimed <laughs> if you found, you know, in the depression that's not yet filled up with water, if you found a female around eggs in the pond, you could, and you took a photograph of her so you could recognize her yeah, again. Yeah. If you drove a stake there, you could come back the next year and plausibly, probably find her within two feet of that stake. You well, think their breeding is that localized? I'm gonna, yes. Again, I don't have the, from the, our, our breeding basis of the trace are larger than that. And I do have many pictures of animals with eggs. But I don't know that I have pictures of the same animal with eggs in the, in the consecutive seasons. But uh, last weekend, I went, I checked out our, our uh, usually it's our first, this is not on the trace. There's a little basin uh, not far from my home. It's along Wells Road. It's a genuine ephemeral mop pond. It doesn't, it floods when it rains. It doesn't, it's not, it's not getting overflow from nearby streams. It floods when the ground is wet enough and it finally, but it was late flooding this year, late, late, late. So marbles are moving in October. They're moving in late September and October here. They'll mate shortly thereafter, and females will probably have eggs in October. But this pond, this basin, again, was not, they had no water in it until mid January. No water until mid January. I'm thinking there's no way that they could, and it's a small basin. But every year when I go in there, I find little marble, uh, marble larvae. Uh, and I, and, I, and not as yet, I haven't found spot, spots, but they're gonna they'll be missing soon when it warms up. So last weekend when I went in, sure enough, there they were. I mean, the basin had just filled, or not filled, it had just it had a, enough water to, to live in if you're a gill bearing. And there they were, and they were little marble larvae. So that's a small basin, but the possibility your friend talks about that were, were I think is high. Now here's this, in addition, uh, this basin I never it doesn't have limbs in it. Or if I find if I turn limbs, I don't find the I don't find the um, the salam, I don't see the salam. I don't think I've ever seen a marble salamander adult in this basin. So my conjecture, and this is a conjecture, is they're using crawfish burrows, um, and I have seen them across crawfish burrows elsewhere. And as it turns out, uh, last Sunday when I checked this basin, I had little little marble um, larvae, and I had brand new tiny little crawfish. So someone in that leaf litter is more interesting than I imagine. Uh, and you have, uh, I, don't, I don't doubt they could do that. And the same animals would go to that same little base and then breed in more or less the same places, you know, for, from year to year, more or less. Interesting. So I have well, another, oh, one, more, one more question. Um, years past, I used to road hunt, drive the roads in September in the heavy rain, looking for uh, adult the marble salamanders crossing. And I at least imagined there was a there was a stretch out by a nearby lake, Lake Purdy. Uh, I've been there in years. <laughs> but, another Webster, another Webster site. <laughs> really, but on the other side of the road from the lake, there were some depressions. And at least I imagined when I saw in the same say hundred yard stretch of road, and I'd see three salamanders, I could actually triangulate the location of the breeding pond they were going to. Oh, yeah by their angles crossing yes. the road. Is that, yes. is that, am I imagining that? Or no. you think get on, get on. In fact, when I have volunteers, I have them write down which building animal is going. And again, the road, uh, inconveniently, the road is not going north, south, it's going northeast, southwest. I confuse everybody. But depending on where you are relative to the breeding base, I know where the breeding bases are, most of them. Um, the animals may be going directly across the road or they may be going, they may be taking a long oblique pathway. It's very consistent. So the animals crossing in our fence 
are well north of the, of the two possible breeding basins of the south of south end of the fence. And those guys, guys and gals head out, and they aren't trying to be safe. They're trying. They're making a dead reckoning for where the ponds you just referenced, something like those are. They are not trying to be safe. They're trying. They're just. They're. You've seen them. They look up like that, a little bit side to side, then they plunge along, and that's not safe. I mean, so the survival odds of those gals at that angle and guys are poor because they're walking right down the middle of the road. I see the same thing in every basin. So where you typically see animals uh, near near a basin, you, most animals are crossing more or less perpendicular. But that's that's because the survivors do that. The ones that are that live that have picked an angle when they were this size when they cross the road. Um, well. Uh, some some place at a more oblique angle relative to the road and the pond, they won't make it, or the odd, their odds are poor. We do get some. We've seen that for years. Anyway, well, I've actually the once the north and south legs of the trace were connected in 2005, populations were just decimated by the increase in traffic. And I then uh, when we first started this, we would get animals crossing obliquely again up closer to um, I-20. Uh, but no, there's no such thing now. Now it's the survive. The, and unless you pick, unless you, by chance, you pick the spot that you you dispersed directly across the pond and you cross perpendicularly, your odds are really poor. They're poor anyway. Um, but we get that all the time. So you're dead on. You're dead on. Very interesting. Appreciate it. Um, how many years have you been doing this, Tom? Well, as, as he said, I've been doing road running now for a long time. But we picked it, we started the trace stuff in 2006 after those legs were connected. And we started with spots. It was someone had told us about a, a big spot pond um, four tenths of a mile south of the interstate. But after walk, walking a few years, we walked further south. And then I, we incidentally discovered Webster's in the road that, that led to a whole other 10 years of work. And, and we kind of run, we've moved farther south with the, with the spots. So our our challenge now is to, because I'm old, you've already seen my knee damage, but I'm doing pretty well. I could not, but we can't do this forever. And we, there's no magic retrofit for, we can't close traffic on this. We don't, I can slow it down hypothetically when I turn the magic key provided by the trace and those little warning boxes, both, in, both ends of this reach we work and it, the speed limit slows at 35 miles per hour for believers, but it doesn't for a lot. <laughs> folks, and so there's some real nice folks that slow down and, and think we're doing great stuff and there are others that don't. Um, some folks drive the trucks at you. Um, so, but we can't do this forever. We need to come up with a, uh, and the trace, if we have something that will work, uh, that is Trace is willing to invest some of this infrastructure improvement money. They need to redo the road anyway and accommodating amphibian crossing. But those are gonna have to work for these guys and for and for frogs and for the challenges is that most of these guys are not climbing like, like this one, like the spot. The Webster's is superb climbers. It's hard for me to envision a panel structure that's going to guide them into, into it won't be an underpass, but something that's open to the sky and flush with the top of the road that they can't climb out of. It's just, it's hard, but we all have to do that. So that's our next goal is to, is to um, come up with something like that. And, but it's got to be user friendly to bicyclists, people driving, people that are having difficulty keeping the car on the road. It's got to be, we can't, we can't cause mayhem. But we, we need to we need to keep these populations going. They've been here, as I tell everyone, the Webster's population there has probably been here since Massanon, the wrong Mississippi, probably 10,000 years. Um, they, they have needed that summer refuge of rock to get through the warm season. Uh, out your way, it's not so, the rocks are not so limiting. They are limiting in most of Mississippi. These don't fly on bird's feet. They don't get around, they get around. They, in our spot, they probably, uh, they, although they don't enter pools, it may be flooded out of a floodplain uh, terrace site during a, a flood event, and they may wash downstream and, and recolonize or colonize other outcrop populations. And that probably happens to some degree, but they aren't. They don't like to get in water. <laughs> we think they're. We, we think they're so, blocked. By, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, we think they're actually blocked by the by the. The water that accumulates in ditches and big rain nights just down slope of our fences. So we think uh, 
they don't want to enter that. I don't think they enter creeks, but we need to do research on that uh, to see what actually, they're not significant creeks. A little temporary drainage might do, but uh, yeah, these are not, these are not animals that want to be in water. They do want to be moist. They have no lungs. They've got to stay, keep the skin wet, but they don't want to be. And again, I got three ruptures last week. We got no spots. I had 44 degrees, wet leaves, uh, very light rain. I had ruptures up, and they were they were breeding that night. That female with the fresh sperm blood, so which I didn't join this lot. This is for all age groups. So, so you have some young folks that are volunteering to come out and uh, learn about salamanders and help. We haven't had, we haven't had kids. Now Deb is concerned about. Um, about folks that need supervision and she and again it's dangerous you don't want to down the road is not closed you don't want to have a child and i have dashed out to say things but you really got to be careful about that as you know and we don't want a kid doing that um or, but, but maybe like college age or high school we have, we have lots of um, will selman here teaches the herpetology of millsaps and he's been good about getting getting students out there and doing projects um he's been great so you know we we get a lot of young people Young people are our hope. I hope. My, I think my generation has failed the plan. We need to do better. We need, you know, we need folks to care about the landscapes that, that perpetuate these guys. Um, and so the Webster's are a good example of that. I mean, they have been there for way uh, long, long before we crossed the boat across the Atlantic in wooden boats with odd notions about ownership and um, straight lines and courthouses. They were here. And we need, I think our species needs to acknowledge that those guys and other species, you know, there's this, everything else as well that was here before without, without deeds. How do we accommodate those guys? How do we all live together somehow? So, so, so you think the Websters have been around longer than spotted salamanders? Oh, no, no. They have been around at that site, at that site. Okay. Like okay. Where the rocks are, they have been, I would go out on a limb on that one. Where you find them? They're they're highly highly disjunct in Mississippi. Not not so much in Alabama. You guys have more than anybody, but in Mississippi they're highly disjunct. The rocks are very limiting. You've got to have access to that. You can't just. I mentioned it this way back in, back in the ice ages when uh, it was cooler. Uh, these could probably get by or not. These I keep pointing to the spot. Webster's could probably get by living in stump holes on a dry summer, a hot summer for the ice age. But since then, when they when when I call it when the uh, when the musical chairs stopped, when it warmed up again, you had to survive where you were. Stump holes wouldn't do. You had to be in something and more something with rock, fissured rock, that was give you a more accessible access to a deep interior where you could survive six more months, stay moist, so you can breathe without feeding, without feeding. So that's my that's my uh, notion of of that. Both species uh, at our at our Webster site um, and these guys. Uh, you can see they are now using spots that have plow furrows. So they were, these were before the trace was put in in the, in the 60s. These were ag lands, not, not the rock outcrop. That was okay. And that was probably not ever, never quite clear. It was just, uh, but it was, it was too rocky to plow, too steep to plow. But um, it's just most of the habitat these guys are using now, uh, say the spots and the marbles, is now, and that's, you can, if you go through in the late summer when the leaf litter is thinnest, you can see clearly see the plow furrows over most of it, a lot of borrow pits. This was unsuitable habitat for salamanders 50 years ago. They're there now. Mm -hmm. uh, given a chance, they came back. The breeding ponds are there. They're there. That's um, that's just neat. That's neat. Tom, I, I got one last question for okay. you. Uh, you know, the, the passenger pigeons that used to storm through and darken the yes. sky are, are long gone. Never see them again. The woodland buffalo and the elk that used to migrate through all these all these large animal migrations are gone. How do you communicate to folks the magic of these seasonal, mig these little seasonal migrations? That's a good you question. Can only see at night or the rain? That's a good question. I have no answer for that. Um, all I can hope is I inoculate people with flies like this, inoculate people with, with um, a passion for that. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you inoculate someone? What's the vaccine for that? How do you, <laughs> how do you, what do you have to get in? Why am I like this? Um, I've been told uh, my boss actually here at the museum. Her, um, her uh, academic um, uh, council uh, major professor, uh, Dr. Jeannie Jones at Miss Mississippi State, 
is her. She's been at the trace of it. She says, knowing what you know, you can't not be out there. And, and she's right. I think even my wife doesn't understand that quite as well, although we've shared many, many, many wet nights out there. But just knowing what, because I learn something new every time I go out. I learned about spiders. I learned about um, all sorts of things that are just neat. But I think the kids need to be inoculated with this. All we hear about in school, we do, we, we learn about, we're, we're improving our leverage over nature. You know what, we learn math, English, um, whatever, skills. But we're not, I don't think we're, well, I, clearly we're not adequately inoculated with uh, a notion of, of what our first citizens need at all, period. Plants, animals, doesn't matter, the whole thing. They were here first. What uh, the whole biosphere? What <laughs> we're not doing that adequately now. I don't know how to do it. So I know when we have our salamander festival and you let kids hold a spotted salamander oh, yeah. or a marble salamander, I, I it's my catcher in the rye moment every year. You know, I'm showing them something much more interesting than an electronic game or a, yeah, a yep. screen. And I, I agree, and I love it. Um, and it's 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 so it is like magic to see them hold one and just see their delight or you know their surprise on how they feel because they don't know anything about them. I agree, and I talk to kids about this all the time, and I think that I do. My only hope is that that works, and I, but I'm not hopeful. I'm really not hopeful. I'm old. Uh, I keep trying. I keep working at this, and I sent pictures out last night from home. I mean, I did my I did my um. Evening walk, we have a very steep neighborhood, right past the place where I fell one year ago, almost one year ago today, right past that. There was a peeper course in some woman's backyard, and there was one Cajun course for our colleagues. So I got back home and to all my neighbors that I have their emails, I sent out pictures of that I've taken elsewhere of peepers and chorus frogs. I want the kids to be thinking about that. So when I asked them what was calling last night, they can say, Oh, it was a southern leopard frog, Mr. Man. And that was um uh, otherwise I just it's it's there's too many other details. We're just going to get, we're lost. I don't know. I'm not hopeful, but I, I keep trying. I'm not giving up. You're, I, doing, I, you're doing a good I, job trying. I'm, I'm going to give you one more example. This is, um, I'm not sure if my wife will. I, Deb didn't want those knee slides on either. Uh, but this is, um, I have uh, an evangelical aunt that I just love her. She's in her 80s. I've enjoyed working with her my whole life. She stopped by the house one night after I'd made this kind of picture, and I had a beautiful picture of a female, female spot crossing, crossing the trace, and she was just transfixed. I said, Carol, how do I pass this enthusiasm on to other people? She said, there's no point. The creation has fallen. <laughs> it, won't be saved. it won't be addressed until the Lord comes back. And I think, you know, what can I do with that? <laughs> I mean, and there, there is that out there. That there's just no point. And I just... Yeah, we, not, we don't. I'm we not, don't believe not. that. <laughs> we <laughs> we believe like there. That. We believe there is a point to saving. I feel like people. I think pictures like the one I had earlier with a handful of little spots. Um, now they aren't as attractive as this one, but that that kind of engages people. I have pictures. You know, I, I see myself as a you know, a dephobicizer. So I take pictures of spiders in my hands. I didn't do this until I was an old adult, but I have a lot of pictures now. Not on black widows, but a lot of spiders. They get on my little fences out here. People are pretty impressed. And again, I've never been bitten. They're not out. They're obviously not out to get me. It's just whatever I can do to pass on enthusiasm and depot besides, I will. So that's it. We we appreciate all that you do, Tom, and uh, I'm fascinated with your stories that you and your reports that you send. I have much better pictures than the poor little opaque pictures, but. Um, mm -hmm. I was just trying to attack them on late. So thank you. All I'm right. Well, I'm working. gonna I'm gonna let you go and thank I'm gonna stop this recording. And we appreciate everyone that has been on this to uh, to hear Tom Mann from uh, Mississippi, who uh, saves the salamanders that are trying to cross the road on Natchez Trace. He tries. Thank you. I, I just turned off the recording, so we can just talk if you want to. Oh, okay. That was great. Uh, do you guys have, do you have a copy of my slides now or no? I do not, no. Okay, so I still, I, I have all of this. You don't have that. I do not. I mean, I have, well, no, I have, I have it up with the recording. Yeah, it, it. So you do have it.
our voice and our photos. Yeah. Okay, so, you, so I don't need to give you anything else. You've got that. No, but if you if you would send me the photo with the um, with the handful of little spots, I would really like that one. We'll use that at our hike that we're going to have. We're doing uh, we're doing some hikes um, this Sunday. We we're going to do it on Saturday, but it's going to be too cold here. So we're going to do it on Sunday and then the following Saturday, and we're going to take people um, and. Jim's going to talk to him about salamanders and uh, my co uh, friends of Shades Creek person, Henry, he's going to talk about the forest habitat and how important it is. And then we have somebody in our group who's a fish expert, and he can talk about a lot of different things, fish, turtles, lots of other things. So he'll talk about that. And so I'd love to have a picture with your handful of the little uh, spotted mets. Okay. Uh, again, that's, I use the term mets. Maybe other folks say metamorphs. I think, but I see folks saying mets too. So that may not be technically correct. But, <laughs> so but, uh, if you could, if you could send that picture, yeah, yeah. I'll use that in our presentation and our hikes. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. That that's just fascinating to me to see a whole handful, thirty five of them. That was four hundred. <laughs> I should. I probably should find. I'll say. I'll see if I can find the report that I wrote for that. Okay. Yeah. I'll send that. Um, That'd be good. It was. I mean, it was. It was not a bright day. It was overcast and raining. It was on the dark side. But the road, they were just everywhere. They wouldn't stop. They just kept coming into the road, coming to the road. Oh, that's, a, that's amazing. Yeah. But again, at night, I get numbers like that with uh, marbles. Uh, generally, not in the open, but in more for in better forest reaches. But I get. I'll get several hundred in a night on a good night, but they've had a good year. This will not be a good year. This is going to be a bad year for marbles, I think, because it just the ponds filled so late. Oh. Uh, I don't think there'll be many. Um, really? Okay. We have we have an area on the other side of I-65 that, uh, in fact, Jim showed me a marbled salamander with her little clutch of eggs uh, this fall. How can you not like that? It's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah it was fantastic. But we've that's, never seen we've right. never seen spotted salamanders over there. Do you think? Do you think they it's not a habitat? You think the same habitat for marbles is not good for spotted, or maybe we no just no no they are, they clearly overlap a lot. And we have within a within a mile of my house, I have four species of abyssal. I've got spots, marbles, uh, uh, talpodium, the mole salamander, and um, and smallmouth salamander. This is when it's within. A mile of my house, that many different species. S marbles are probably using the margins of our pond. We have a pond on our property. In fact, Deb found a marble on the porch two days ago. Why, you know, why was that? Um, but we don't get spots breeding in the neighborhood, which is interesting. There are a lot of ponds that would do, but they're not here now. But uh, not far down the road, I get them, uh, uh, and I go a lot of them. I get, I get marbles and and moles and opaque and marble up so in spots. I get those three breeding together in lots of places. Hmm. Uh, I get mar I think marbles are more generalist. They will use they use floodplain terrace pools that spots mainly don't use, but they're also used by um, smallmouth salamanders. So but they're they're generalist. They they find a way they make do. And again they don't have to have water. They have to 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 um, breed. They need water for a while to to nurtured the young, but that's about it. Um, mm -hmm. 